Now we need to talk about what classical economics really is. We've mentioned him a couple times, but the key to understanding this is our buddy Adam Smith. He wrote a book. It was published in 1776. It actually took him 12 years to write. It's We call it The Wealth of Nations. It actually has a much longer title, but The Wealth of Nations. It's the tale of change in economics. It's John Locke. It's how does modern society work? Remember, he's writing as the Industrial Revolution is starting and the world's changing from being agriculture to being an industrial world with factories and labor involved in these things. And it's a whole different world. And Adam Smith is going to tell us all about it. So, theory based on what? First, free markets. Adam Smith lived in a world where kings and dukes and lords and all these people decided things, where you really couldn't start a business without somebody else's permission, where your choice of work for your life might be determined by others. He believed that the key to the world was individual choice. He believed that free markets, when free individuals, businesses and consumers and workers and everybody was out there trying to figure out what they did best and what was best for them and making their own choices, that the world would turn out better, that we can all make choices for ourselves better than other people can make them for them. And he used this word natural, and we'll talk about it again, but this word natural, which is not just his word, there's natural philosophy, there's other naturals in the world. But he used this word natural a lot to, to tell us that this choice, this freedom, this is the key to um, the world working right, this word natural. Adam Smith's most well-known follower is probably this guy, David Ricardo. Ricardo actually never met Smith. Smith was dead before Ricardo started doing anything. Ricardo was a guy who became a stockbroker at the age of 14. Um, he developed the theory of comparative advantage that we already talked about, the fact that if you specialize in trade and you work with others and cooperate, that everything is great. Wrote a book in 1815 didn't refer to things as economics, referred to them as political economy, and he's the first person who really develops this theory of political economy. Maybe you can say he's the first person who wrote a textbook, an economic textbook kind of thing. Ricardo's best friend is this guy named Thomas Malthus. Malthus was a minister. Malthus is a little older than Ricardo. They disagreed about just about everything. As we'll see, a lot of the things that classical economists believed in, Malthus didn't actually believe in. He believed more like what we're going to see in Chapter 10. He was more of a precursor to John Maynard Keynes than he is a traditional classical economist. But he's best known in the universe for believing in a theory of population explosion. He lived in this world where the, the British population for the first time in hundreds of years was booming. It's because we discovered um, germs and there were huge uh, improvements in medicine and cleanliness and all this stuff. And it results in this huge population explosion, which between Malthus and Ricardo and others paints a picture of how the world's going to be. If the population is exploding, you're always going to have a large labor force. You're going to have tons and tons and tons of people looking for jobs which means a couple things. One is wages are going to tend to be low. And Ricardo actually said subsistence, not meaning just barely enough to get by, but kind of the base level of society, that wages are always going to tend to be, for most people, are always going to tend to be what, what that minimum societal view of what you need to have is. So lots of workers, low wages. Workers are not going to have much, in fact, no control over the market. Workers are going to have to deal in that market just like everybody else. If you don't like the wage you're going to get paid, there's 20 other people out there who would be happy to take your job kind of thing. Classical economics. Oh. What do we know? Well, 
for all of your life, you've been sitting around, you've been hearing people say, hey, I've been keeping it real, and you didn't understand what that meant. What we're going to tell you about keeping it real is that the wage you get paid, the dollars you get paid, like $10 an hour, that's a nominal wage. If we know that I get paid $10 an hour, and I know that a loaf of bread costs $2, Really, my pay is the equivalent of five loaves of bread. That five loaves of bread is my real wage. My real wage is the things that I can buy with the money that I'm paid. If bread is $5 a loaf and I'm making $10 an hour, I'm worse off than if bread is $2 a loaf and I'm making $10 an hour. So my real wage... My real wage is maybe what matters. So, again, here's Ricardo and the classicals. I don't care about the prices of things. I don't care what my wage is. What I care about is what I can buy when I go to the grocery store. And my basket of groceries isn't $100. It's 10 hours of work or 7 hours of work or however many work hours it takes to get that basket of stuff. That's what matters. So now, what's this going to mean? Workers, in Ricardo's view, only care about their real wage. Workers have no reason to care whether they get paid $10 an hour or $20 an hour or $2 an hour. What matters to them is what, how many hours of work it takes for them to get that basket of groceries. If prices are going down and your company says we're going to cut your pay as long as there's still that balance between what prices were and what you're getting paid so that you can still go buy that basket of groceries at the end of the day then you don't care okay what matters is your real wage you're keeping it real i can go to the store and buy a loaf of bread and a jug of wine and go home that's my real wage I don't care whether it costs me $5 to buy that loaf of bread and jug of wine or $500 to buy that loaf of bread and jug of wine. As long as I can buy it, my real wage is what matters. If that's the way the world is, if there's lots of workers, if there's free markets, if we only care about the real and not the nominal, we don't care about the $10, which is the nominal, we care about the five loaves of bread, which is the real. Wages and prices are going to move up and down. In Ricardo's view, Smith's view, the real version, and I don't mean real in the sense of real, but you know, what we should see in the world is all prices should be doing what stock market prices do. They go up and down, and it's not just necessarily going up and down by the day. It might even be going down, up and down by the minute or the hour. Prices and wages are flexible up and down. They move up and down continuously, as the market changes, okay? we would say, we, modern, modern economists, we would say that, that those flexible in wages and prices create equilibrium in the market. That the market is always going to be in equilibrium because wages and prices are always adjusting very quickly to whatever's going on in that market and we get equilibrium. The classicals didn't use that E word they use this natural words. When a classical economist says natural, they mean equilibrium. But they weren't mathematical. This, the group we're talking about now, there's an, their followers later on at the end of the 1800s, we call the neoclassicals, they took this theory and they made it mathy, and they put math into it. But Smith, Ricardo, they're not mathematical types. They write prose, they write this out in words, and they don't use this word equilibrium, they use this word natural. There's a natural price. That's the equilibrium price. The market finds this natural price by a back and forth process between buyers and sellers. Okay? So their theory, this classical theory, is going to say all we need to do is have all the markets in equilibrium. And if all the markets are in equilibrium, by definition, everything must be good and right with the world. We need free markets, 
And if we have free and properly functioning markets, the whole system will be at its natural level. It will be at equilibrium and everybody will be happy.